Brothers and sisters in Christ, um, my name is Jeff Joquin, husband to my beautiful wife Sandy, father to Faith McKenzie, who is 21 years old, and to my son Jonathan Andrew Joquin, who would be 36 years old. You know, I've been blessed the last three years to travel the country, three or four years to travel the country, speaking to men, women, children, high school students about my story. But really what I've found is I'm not the only one that has a problem with mercy. I'm not the only one who doesn't understand mercy. Whether it was the 14-year-old girl at a local um, Catholic high school here in Central Florida who walked up to me after the talk and said, because of hearing the pain and suffering that you went through with your abortion, I'm going to continue to carry the child that's in my womb. Or the 55-year-old man uh, from Central Florida who, after introducing me uh, at a talk that I gave at a local parish, before he finished his introduction, he said, I want to embarrass this man because I heard him talk a year previously and because of hearing his struggles with pornography, I entered into rehab. Now that particular man was a retired colonel in the Marine Corps. Or maybe it's the 82-year-old man in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, who after my talk literally ran about as fast as I've ever seen a grown man run, and he hit me full speed and nearly tackled me pinned me up against the wall and told me thank you as he was shivering in tears. He said, I can't believe that God could forgive a man like me. We'll finish that story in a little bit. But the point being with all that men and women and the purpose of this talk tonight, mercy, mercy me, is I don't think really any of us understand God's mercy. In fact, I know we don't. If we did, there'd be long lines at the confessional at every parish in our diocese. I think what happens is when we receive trauma in our lives, whenever that is and wherever that is and however that occurs, we hug our spiritual cactus, okay? We do that as a knee-jerk reaction to the pain. But the problem is, men and women, is we never let go of that spiritual cactus. We continue to hug it. And when it's recommended to us that we let go of that spiritual cactus, what we do is we hug it even more because we're used to that pain so what I want to try to do tonight is just unpack that. Unpack that misunderstanding of God's mercy in our lives. And I want to do that in, with four different pillars. The first pillar is the, the method of mercy that's most familiar to all of us. And that's God forgiving us. That's the vertical part of the cross. The second pillar of mercy is mankind forgiving mankind. That's the horizontal part. That's us forgiving each other for what we've done to each other. And that's just not friends and families and uncles and fathers. That's enemies too. That's the second pillar of mercy. The third pillar of mercy is one that is very, very, very misunderstood and that's us forgiving ourselves. Forgiving ourselves. And I was praying over this talk for about six months, and I said to God, I said, okay, God, we got three pillars. Is three pillars enough? Is three pillars enough, God? He said, no. He said, could you do me a favor and tell my children to forgive me too? And that's the fourth pillar of mercy, 
is us forgiving God. If you can imagine that, he who, he who is perfect in nature and only gives us what we need, we have to forgive him too. So I'm gonna work through, I'm gonna walk through some examples that I've been blessed to share with, um, I think the range is between 14 and 82 years old, and share some stories on each one of those pillars of mercy. And the only hope, ladies and gentlemen, the only hope is that you can understand what that, what Jesus meant when he said those words through the prophet Isaiah. You are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. That's God speaking to each one of us, telling us that he loves us. That's the goal of the evening tonight. But in order to do that, I don't want to sit on a soapbox up here and talk to you about mercy and tell you I have it figured out, because I don't. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about my prodigal son story so it puts it in perspective for you. Our spiritual journey is like an onion. Every time I tell this story, something new comes up in my life that I've done. See, my prodigal son story started at about eight years old when my grandfather walked into my mother's dining ro- uh, living room and he had a little glass of alcohol in his hands. It was brandy. I didn't know it at the time. I was eight years old. But I took a little sip of that brandy and I knew at eight years old how broken I was. Eight years old, how broken I was. When my grandfather left the room, I grabbed the bottle of brandy and I took a swig of it. That's at eight years old, people. But my prodigal son journey doesn't stop there. At the age of 10, I was exposed to hardcore pornography at a friend's house. Changed my life forever. Parents and grandparents, you give phones to your kids and your grandkids. Just understand one thing, and you'll hear a story about this later. You might as well hand them a pet rattlesnake before you hand them a phone without net nanny or covenant eyes on it. Because at 10 years old, I was broken. I was really broken at 10 years old. And I've struggled with pornography every single day since then. I'll let you know when I have it figured out. But that's just the beginning of the journey. So when that, when you start to hug that spiritual cactus, as I did when I was 10 years old, you begin to realize that you have two options. I can either turn to God and let him take the pain away, or I can turn from God and dig a de- dig a deeper hole. So what did I do? I started drinking alcohol on a regular basis at the age of 13 years old. I started smoking marijuana at 14 years old. But these are all gateway drugs. At the age of 15, I was at a party in New Bedford, Massachusetts. It was very busy, packed. I looked at my friend, he looked at me. There was a door behind us that led to the basement. And I turned and looked and the the basement was completely pitch black. There was only one person in it. He was standing next to a table. That table had a pile of white powder on it. He looked at me and he said, would you like to try some? And I didn't realize that at the time it looked like a 15 or 16 year old kid, but it was the devil. And I said, sure. And that's when my pathway of cocaine abuse started. 15 years old, hugging the spiritual cactus. Fast forward to 17, I, you know, you make bad decisions when you're drinking alcohol and snorting cocaine every day, you make bad decisions. I got a call one day 
back when phones were attached to the wall and not in your pocket. My father handed me the phone. He said, it's your girlfriend. I said, okay. She said, we have a problem. I said, geez, you couldn't even say hello? Right into the, right into the meat and potatoes, huh? I said, what is that problem? And she said, I'm pregnant. I told her, give me 24 hours and I'll think about it. Even though I was raised in a good Catholic Christian family, I told her I'd think about it, not pray about it, not consult my local priest. Called her back 24 hours later. I said, set up the appointment. We're going to have an abortion. Two weeks later, we were driving to Providence, Rhode Island. I never asked this, this young lady if she wanted to have the baby. I told her, tell me how much it costs, and I'm going to drive you there. So we drove 45 minutes away from, because the, the local football star couldn't be seen uh, at the local abortion clinic. Drove 45 minutes, didn't say a single word to that young lady. Dropped her off at the port of cachet She asked me if I was going to come in. Didn't have the courage to do that either. Two hours later, she came out of the abortion clinic. The nurse handed me the pain medicine. I drove home and broke up with her that same day. See, for me, my spiritual cactus at that point in time is I wanted to go off and I had off, had, was going to play college football, but I wanted to play in the NFL. So fast forward, I kept drinking and kept snorting and somehow, some way, went into college and became a two-time preseason All-American and had the Buffalo Bills visit at least three of the football games that I'm aware of. And to show you how bad I was hugging my spiritual cactus at the time, this one game the, the, the Buffalo Bills scout came to, we, we, you know they're coming ahead of time. Your coach lets you know at the beginning of the week. And after the game, you're going to meet with the scout, talk to them, see what they got in store. Well, this first, the second time the scout came, it was to a game we were playing against Springfield, uh, college and by God's graces I had a particularly good game that game game was over scout was getting ready to come over to our locker room but he made the mistake of going to the opponent's locker room first and before he got there my friends with all the party favors had showed up so as broken and demented as my brain was I left with my two friends and did not wait for the professional scout. Five minutes is all it would take to come into our locker room. But the prodigal son journey doesn't end there, people. That's the sugarcoating part. All through college, still had the alcohol and drug problems that I never was able to shake loose because I could never turn to God. Graduated college, went off to my degree, started working. At the age of 24, a bunch of my friends, summertime, age of 24, a bunch of my friends came home from their respective jobs, and we had a keg party at Round Hill. Well, we were drinking and smoking and snorting everything that we could get our hands on that day. Left, I left about 11 or 12 o'clock at night, got home to my parents. I was still living with my parents at the time. Got home to their house. And I was lying on their den floor having a cocaine-induced heart attack. I was going to die that night. No, no doubt about it. There was so much pain and stress that I had put on my heart in the first 24 years of my life. I was going to die. So I did the only thing that I could remember my good, faithful, Catholic, Christian parents telling me to do, and that's to pray to Jesus. 
I called up my brother who lived in Cape Cod at the time as the last ditch effort and I said, bro, I love you, but I'm gonna die here tonight on mom and dad's den floor. He said, let me call 911, bro. I said, nope. I said, if this Jesus person is real, then I'm gonna pray to him right now and he's either gonna come and save me or I'm gonna die. So ladies and gentlemen, I, I let go of the spiritual cactus at the age of 24. And all I can tell you is I had an experience that I haven't felt since, but I've been chasing ever since. And that's no high that you can't get high like that with alcohol, you can't get high with drugs. It's a feeling of peace like you could never imagine. So let's just hit pause right there on my prodigal son journey because we came here to talk about mercy. But I can promise you that day I felt mercy like, you, like, like I can't explain. And you would think I would have turned to God, but I didn't. So let's just hit pause there on my story, because I'm here to talk about other people's stories, not just mine. So let's talk about the first pillar of mercy. And I think the best way to explain the first pillar of mercy is to talk about the paralytic, the healing of the paralytic. Mark second chapter, verse one through 12. And I'm just gonna talk through this scripture. I'm not gonna read the scripture. I'm not gonna pretend like I'm a theologian. I'm just gonna talk about what God wants to do with us, each one of us in our lives. See, cause this paralytic, he came with a group of people, scripture says, a group of people, not just four carrying the stretcher. He came with a group of people. So I say to you men and women and, and to all the young adults that are sitting in the bleachers, who do you have carrying you right now? Who do you have leading you? And where are they leading you? Because if not, they're not leading you to Jesus, then all they're doing is leading you astray. Then scripture goes into the four people that were carrying the paralytic the four people that were carrying him. And what did they do? They got to the, the house that Jesus was at in Capernaum, but it was a full house. It was a packed house. So what did they do? Did they give up? Did they turn away? Did they say, okay, Mr. Paralytic, we walked 10 miles here with you, but Jesus is too busy? No. They were persistent. What did they do? They had to climb the side of the house for one. Two, they had to dig a hole through the roof. And then three, they lowered the paralytic down. And what does Jesus say? He says, seeing their faith, their faith, not the faith of the paralytic, not the faith of the five, four people carrying him, not the faith, it was the faith of the entire group of people that had led this paralytic to Jesus. Men and women, do you have people like that in your lives leading you to Jesus? And what did he do? Jesus said, your faith has saved you. Son, your sins are forgiven. First stage of healing for that man. His spiritual sins were forgiven. But then in typical fashion, what did the scribes and the Pharisees do? They start throwing rocks at Jesus, right? Who but God alone can forgive sin? Who, the, who did they think they were talking to, by the way? But who but God alone can forgive sin? And Jesus, knowing that they were saying these things in their heart, said to them, what is easier to say? Rise, pick up your mat and walk, or your sins are forgiven. 
he was saying this, asking this question to the scribes. And before they even had a chance to answer, what does he say? He says, so that you know that the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins on earth. I say to you, paralytic, rise and pick up your mat and walk. That's the second healing. He healed him physically. My wife and daughter and I have gone to Lourdes three different times. Has anybody here been blessed to go to Lourdes before? You get in that water that's about 38 degrees and you do it completely, you do it in your birthday suit, okay? And I can promise you it's an experience you never forget for a lot of different reasons, one of which being jumping into 38 degree weather, a uh, water, excuse me, is chilling to say the least. But the three of us and, and the, the, the two others are in the back of the room right now and they'll, they'll tell you the same thing. We went there seeking physical healing. But what did we receive? We didn't receive phys the physical healing. We received the spiritual healing. And that's what Jesus wanted to do for the paralytic. Not only did he heal, it's the only person in scripture and Father Franco, correct me if I'm wrong, the only person in Scripture that was healed two different times, and guess what? He never asked to be healed. He never said a word. See, Scripture is full of examples of people that came to Jesus asking him, Son of David, have mercy on me. The Canaanite woman, the ten lepers, Countless times people came to Jesus asking him for mercy and he gave it to them. But the paralytic did not say a single word, but he was healed. His faith and that of those with him healed him. Jesus wants to heal each one of us. The question are, are do we have the humility necessary to ask him? Hit rewind back to the story where I hit pause and I had been saved by Jesus. Completely saved, miraculous healing. So you would think at that point in time in my life at 24 years old, I'd start turning back to him, maybe praying a little bit, maybe going to church once in a while, maybe going to confession once a year, but I didn't. I took on a new addiction at the age of 25. That addiction's called workaholism. Maybe some, some of you are familiar with that. It's where you work 12 hours a day, six days a week for them three inch by six inch sheets of paper with dead presidents on them. And I did that and God blessed me. The private jets, the fancy SUVs, the luxury suite tickets at every sporting event. I climbed the ladder of success, all right. It just took me a long time to figure out it was up against the wrong wall. But fast forward by God's graces, by the age of 38, I was in church one time with my beautiful wife and beautiful daughter at Our Lady of the Rosary, and a, a short man, small in stature, but a giant in faith, got up behind the ambo, and he started talking about a men's program. That men's program was that man is you. And he started talking about being an authentic male leader in the family and eating with your family and sacrificing for your family and praying for your family. And I made one of the biggest mistakes of my life. I turned, over, I turned and looked to my beautiful wife and my beautiful daughter and they look back at me and they, with their eyes, all they said was that man is not you, dad, or hubby. So I started taking my faith serious at the age of 38. I got a confessor by the name of Father Ed Sylvia, blessed man, I love him to death. Met with him the first time, told him a little bit about my story. He told me, Jeff, you are a spiritual pretzel and I don't even know I can help you. That's how bad you are. But he said to me, Jeff, you need to do a general confession. 
He gave me the books for it. You know, you, you basically peel the spiritual onion back of your life. And for me, that was 38 years of sin. See, one of the things that, one of the, one of the um, ignominious titles that I have is I had broken all 10 commandments by the age of 17 years old. So that process of unpacking my sins was very painful at 38 years old because I had a lot, a lot of things to confess. But I ended up going and doing that general confession. And about an hour and 15 minutes into that general confession, I had to confess that I took the life of my unborn son. The priest was crying. I was crying. When I got done with the confession, he walked out of the confessional and threw his arms around me, and he said, welcome home, son. Welcome home, son. See, I had run from the hound to heaven for 38 years of my life. I had taken so much from so many people. And yes, I had borrowed $200 from a friend to pray, to, to pay for a complete stranger taking my unborn son in my girlfriend's womb. I had sacrificed my son on the altar of convenience. I had denied my fatherhood. But you know what? In one instance, in one split second, brothers and sisters, the hound of heaven had come. He took my etch-a-sketch that was completely full of sin. And he said, Jeff, your sins are paid for. Spiritual etch-a-sketch, a lifetime of sin. In an instant, the hound of heaven set me free. I'm reminded of a 16-year-old girl when I gave a talk here locally in Central Florida who after the talk, after the talk was done, the two priests that were there asked me to stick around at the picnic table uh, and, and, and speak to the children. This was kids that were in high school. That 16-year-old girl proceeded to tell me that at the age of eight years old, her parents gave her a cell phone. At the age of nine, she was hooked on hardcore pornography. At the age of 16, she was mentally ruined, brothers and sisters in Christ, mentally ruined. She said, Mr. Joke, when I can't thank you enough for talking about pornography, because I've been addicted for the last six years of my life. I am not worthy. I am useless. I have no value in life. What I've let boys do to me is disgraceful. I looked at her in the eyes as I was choking tears back, and I said to, I said to her, I said, young lady, she said, who could forgive me? This is a young lady that grew up in a devout Catholic family. She was playing imposter syndrome, men and women, imposter syndrome. Her parents thought everything was great when she showed up at church on Sunday, went to confession once every six months, but that girl was broken. She said, Who in the world, how could God possibly forgive somebody like me? And I looked at her and I said, you're never going to know until you try. And by God's graces, standing not very far away was a holy priest who just so happens to be in attendance today. And he set that young girl free from her captivity. Jesus healed her that day. I'm reminded of the 82-year-old man that I mentioned at the beginning from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I gave a talk there. There were three tiers of seating, lower level, middle level, upper level. 
I knew when I got done with the talk that I was going to have to run as fast as I could around the side so that I could get to the table so that I could prepare myself for the, for the conversations that were about to happen. But you know what? That 82-year-old man had a different story in mind. Because after I got done with the talk and everybody was cheering for Jesus, right? All I'm here to do is hand out the permission slips, people. You want to cheer for somebody, you cheer for the only one that can hear you, heal you. But I got done with that talk and I, that 82-year-old man got up and I ran as fast as I could to the side to get away from him, but he pinned me up against the wall and he pressed me back up against the wall with both of his hands. And he was trembling and crying like a newborn baby, trembling with fear. And I said, brother, what do you have, in, what do you have on your mind? He said, you don't understand. There's no way that God could forgive somebody like me. I said, what do you mean? He said, 62 years ago, I had an abortion. And I have never had the courage to tell anybody. Never mind the priest. I put my arm around that 82-year-old man, and we walked about 50 feet in front of us. There was an army of priests there that day. Thanks be to God. And that man got set free from his 60 years of captivity. Men and women, Jesus is dying on the cross to set you free. He's dying on the cross to set you free. That's the first pillar of mercy. Let's talk about the second pillar of mercy. What's the second pillar of mercy? It's the one where we forgive each other. Man forgiving man, woman forgiving woman for the sins and the transgressions that we do against each other. And what I want to do, and I want, to, I want this to burn into your heart, into your mind, and into your soul. Because I want to focus on the shortest word in the Our Father. What is the shortest word in the Our Father? You see it up on the screen. It's the word as. And what does that line of the Our Father say? And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others. So as for the grammar teachers in here, what is as in that sentence? As is a conjunction. And what does it mean? It means in the same manner that. So think about that for a second. Now we're talking about the only prayer that Jesus gave us while he was on this earth praying to his father. And he wants us to mitigate the level of forgiveness, mitigate it. He, he says it right there. As we, for, uh, you know, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive others. So what does that mean? That does not mean that the sacrament of reconciliation is limited. It's complete, it's thorough, it's 100% period. But what I want you to do when you pray that prayer, every time you pray that prayer, is understand this. Each one of us has an expiration date on us. I hate to say it that way, but we're no different than a bottle of milk. We have an expiration date. And when that expiration date happens, we're going to stand before Jesus and we're going to be judged. We're going to be judged on the number of mortal sins that we have on our soul. Hopefully we don't have any. We're going to be judged on the venial sins that we have. Hopefully, we don't have any. And then as a um, consolation prize, dare I say, Jesus, I believe, my opinion, is going to look at how we forgave others during our lifetime before he decides where our final stay is going to be. So every time you say the Our Father, and I know we like to rattle through it, right? Our Father, I want you to think about that one line 
okay? Hit rewind a second. After I had gotten my general confession and the hound of heaven had set me free, part of my healing process was to share the fact that I had an abortion with my beautiful wife. And she helps carry that cross every day. The next step on my journey was to name my son and have a relationship with him. But you know, even after I did those three steps, brothers and sisters, it didn't help. There was still a hole in my heart, a pain, a deep pain, a deep wound. So I went into my um, confessor, Father Ed, spiritual director. He said, Jeff, you know what you need to do now? And any time he ever said that, I'd get nervous. And I said, okay, Father Ed, what's next? He said, you need to call up your former girlfriend and apologize to her. What? What? I said, Father Ed, you're a holy priest, and, and I look up to you, but that is the single stupidest idea I have ever heard before. And he looked me right in the eyes and he said, Jeff, how much does it still hurt that you have a son in heaven? I said, it hurts bad. He said, how much do you think that poor young lady that you may do that, how much pain you think she has in her heart? That day after spiritual con confession, I, I went, I didn't have to open the door. I just crawled right underneath it and walked out to my car. I got a hold of some friends. This was, remember, this is 20 some odd years later, 25 years later. I got the, the number from my uh, former girlfriend. I got permission from my beautiful wife. And I called her. I was trembling like I've never trembled in any way, shape, or form in my entire life. The devil told me right up until the point in time I hit send to make the call that I didn't need to do it, that it was her fault. But I made the call she picked up after a brief introduction. I said, could you possibly forgive me for what I did to you? Never asked you if you wanted to have the child. Drove you to an abortion clinic. Didn't even go in and broke up with you 24 hours later. She forgave me, and I can tell you that 500-pound gorilla men and women came off my shoulders, and I've never been the same since. I'm reminded of a man in his 50s. We, I think it was here locally, did a talk, and any time I give a talk, I, I ask God to to help me see into the souls of the people that are in the room and help me to touch. I want you to speak to that individual, Lord. I want you to speak directly to them. And this particular man, he had, he had the neon sign pointed towards him that God needed to speak to him. So when I got done with the talk, went over to the table, and there was about 15 people, 20 people in line that wanted to talk. Everybody has something different to share. Whatever that spiritual cactus is, alcohol, drugs, maybe your father didn't tell you how proud, how proud he was of you. Maybe your father never told you he loved you. Maybe your uncle did something to you that was unthinkable. Maybe you can't get along with your kids or they can't get along with your brother, your sister, whoever it may be. After these 15 people in succession came up, each one of them had a different story. I did not see the man that God had me focused on. I went to the back of the room and I started praying. And I said, God, I failed you today. I failed you today because of my pride, because of my inability to be humble. I could not connect with that man. And I failed you, mother. And the second that I said mother, I felt a touch on my right shoulder. 
And it was that man who God had me focused on. And like so many of the millions of wounded men out there, he started shaking like a baby. He told me he has four children, and he named the first two the oldest. And he said after the second child was born, my wife and I both lost our jobs. And I forced my wife to have two abortions. I forced her to have two abortions. And I have never even, even had a single discussion with my wife since those two abortions happened. And then he had his third. They had their third and they had their fourth children. He said, in, just in tears, broken, like it's hard to explain the brokenness of a man who's made a decision like that. But he said, because you've shared with me your pain today, I am going to leave the conference right now. I am going to go home and I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to beg forgiveness from my wife. Beg forgiveness for putting her through the unthinkable. And I said, just do one thing before you leave. Go see that priest over there and get straight with God. Once you get straight with God, then you can get straight with your beautiful wife. Mercy towards others, brothers and sisters. I was up in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, giving a talk one time. There was 1,200 people there. When we got done, as God is my witness, there was 25 people in line. And I spoke with men from 10 o'clock in the morning until 4 p.m. in the afternoon, nonstop, on every issue you could possibly imagine. But this one was new for me because a man in his 30s walked up and he handed me his phone. And that was an, that was an unusual response. I had never gotten that one. I, I said, okay, sir, what do, you, uh, what do you want me to do with your phone? He said, could you read the text message that's at the, the, the first text message? And I looked at it and it had gotten sent in the last 15 minutes. And it was a heartfelt apology to his former girlfriend for forcing her to have an abortion. It takes a lot of courage, men and women, to reach out and admit you're wrong and admit you need to be forgiven. Those are just a few examples of that. But I, I like this example. Um, probably more than any of those. I'm sure you're all familiar with St. Maria Goretti. Born into an Italian farming family in early, early 1900s. Her father died when she was nine years old. So she and her family had to move in with the Serenellis. She worked in the house, and the rest of her siblings and her, and her mother worked in the field. So that left her home alone with a 20-year-old Alessandro Serenelli. Well, Alessandro Serenelli decided one day that he was going to make inappropriate advances on this 11-year-old girl. She would not give in. He stabbed her 14 times and essentially put her on her deathbed. But the entire, during the entire incident and all the way up to when she crossed over from this life to the next, she was forgiving Alessandro for what he had done to her. She passed away. Alessandro was found guilty. He went to prison. 
But because of her forgiveness, because of the mercy that she showed him while he was killing her, he had a conversion in prison. 27 years later, he was released from prison. The first thing that Alessandro Serenelli did is he went to St. Maria Goretti's mother and begged her for forgiveness. And she extended that. He ended up joining, going into the, he was a lay capuchin, completely changed his life. And on, in, uh, on June 24th of 1950, he was at the canonization for St. Maria Goretti. See, the person that you forgive today, whether you, they need to be forgiven or not, but the person that you forgive today, you can set them free from your captivity in their captivity. We need to start emancipating ourselves from mental slavery, men and women. That comes from Bob Marley, not from me. But why do we let people live rent-free in our head? Why do we do that? When all it takes is forgiveness, all it takes is extending mercy, a little bit of humility, and you set them free, and you set yourself free. That's the second pillar of mercy. Man forgiving his fellow man, woman forgiving their fellow woman. What's the third pillar of mercy? The third pillar of mercy is us forgiving ourselves. About a year and a half ago, I was interviewed by Stellar Cinematics as part of a documentary that's going to air this Saturday on EWTN. I'll give you information on that in a minute. It was a three-hour interview where the gentleman asked dozens and dozens and dozens of questions. And he got to the end of it and he said, Jeff, he said, you really have an amazing story, but I have to ask you the most important question. And this may not make the documentary, but only if you give me the authorization. He said, you have never forgiven yourself, have you? And I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, I, I, I'll tell you this is how I answered that question. I said to him, I said, you know, Helmet is his name. He's Indian. I said, Helmet, one day, when all of purgatory is cleaned out, and me, the last person, gets invited to heaven, I'm going to give St. Peter a high five. I'm going to bend down and kiss the feet of our Lord and Our Lady. And then I'll forgive myself completely when my son walks up to me and he tells me that he loves me. That is when I will set myself free from the captivity. Until then, I'll travel from one end of this planet to the other end of this planet, telling people about God's mercy and how he wants to set us free. And gentlemen, I just, I, I want to, I want to say this before before I go on. Lost fatherhood comes in many different forms, gentlemen. It comes in the form of you taking your girlfriend to a clinic and having an abortion. It comes in the form of getting a vasectomy. It comes in the form of making your wife or girlfriend take the pill. This is for you guys in the back. It comes in many forms, lost fatherhood. Lost motherhood comes in many forms. It comes in the form of miscarriage, stillbirth, infertility. Don't think that just because you didn't bring your girlfriend or you brought yourself to an abortion clinic that you're free from this. 
When my son tells me he loves me, that's when I'll set myself free. Until then, the tens of millions of men and women who have experienced lost fatherhood and lost motherhood are going to hear me preaching from the mountaintops because 150,000 babies a day, people, I will repeat that, 150,000 babies a day are aborted in this world. Three to 4,000 babies a year, excuse me, a day, forgive me, are aborted in the United States. That's the size of Worcester, Massachusetts, the population, 150,000 babies a day in the world, the size of Bordeaux, France, Amarillo, Texas, every day are being aborted in this world. Every second, two babies are lost. And we pretend like the greatest atrocity known to man, the greatest atrocity known to man does not exist when 150,000 babies today will lose their lives. I'm reminded of forgiving ourselves of the man who introduced me at a talk that we gave And he read a brief introduction, and then after that, as I walked towards the mic, he walked over and he said, hold on a minute, I want to embarrass this man. And he said, a year ago, I heard this man talk about his struggles with pornography, and because of that, I entered into rehab for pornography, and I've been set free from that captivity for, he used 340 days. Now, why am I telling that story? That man is a Marine, a retired Marine colonel, a colonel in the Marines. You talk about self-discipline. You talk about um, self-control. That's what the Marines are all about. But this man, in his words, said to me that he could not f forgive himself for his lack of self-control. And it wasn't until he could forgive himself for watching things on the computer that he shouldn't, that he could get healed from God. The third pillar is to forgive ourselves. Brothers and sisters, we have to let go. We have to let go of the spiritual cactus. It's the only way you're going to set yourself free. It's the only way. So the fourth pillar, let's go on to the fourth pillar. When I was praying about this talk, I thought that there was only going to be three of these pillars of mercy. But then God, in, in um, adoration, smacked me in the side of the head, and he said, no, Jeff. He said, I need, you to, I need you to help get my people to let me, to stop nailing, to put down the hammer and put down the nails and stop nailing me to the cross because my will and their will conflicted with each other. Listen, brothers and sisters, bad things happen to us, right? Bad things happen. It's how we respond to them that's important. And I'm going to give you two quick stories. I'm going to give you two quick stories of that. It's our response to tragedy. It's not the tragedy itself. And God is not responsible for it. We have free will, and he wants the best for us. I'm reminded of this family that had that um, in Central Florida that had nine pregnancies. Nine pregnancies, brothers and sisters. So you're probably saying to yourself, wow, I'd hate to pay for that food bill on Sunday at Publix, right? Well, those nine pregnancies by his will, have only resulted in two children. The other seven pregnancies, six of them were miscarriages, and one of them was a stillbirth. I want to talk just a minute or two about the stillbirth. This beloved husband and wife were ready for their first child, after having a couple miscarriages. But this was going to be the pregnancy where they were able to deliver. 
That beloved family went almost to full term at 37, 38 weeks, whatever it was. And one week before this beautiful baby boy was going to be born, the mother got an infection in her womb. The infection led to the heart of the child. And the unthinkable happened. That poor baby boy lost his life in his mother's womb. That beloved family decided, obviously, to deliver the baby who who had passed. They delivered this baby, and they stayed with that baby for that first night. The hospital was kind enough to let mother and father be with their child. This man goes on to tell me how That night, it was just an unthinkable pain for this family. But in the morning, when it was time to work on funeral arrangements and poor baby, the poor baby was uh, needed to get handed over to the nurses. Just a a gut-wrenching experience this poor father tells me about. That husband and wife for the next year, they loved God, but they hated him for what he allowed to have happen. They loved God, but they held, they did everything with their humanity to let him off the hook, but there was still so much pain, understandably. But that beloved family, the faithful family that they are now have two bouncing Baby children, I want to I wanna stay very uh, generic there, because they were faithful to him. They were trusting in God. So that horrific experience turned them into the loving arms of God. But I'm going to give you one last story, and that's the story of a former employee, of, a, a, a fellow employee of mine, at the previous company that I worked for. It was a Saturday morning, and he was in a hurry. He had some place to be. He rushed out the front door, jumped in his car, turned the uh, truck on, put it in reverse, backed up, and he felt a bump behind him. He said, oh, maybe Junior left the skateboard in the driveway again. Maybe Junior left a toy or something in the driveway. So he put the car in park, jumped out of his pickup truck and went behind, and he saw the unthinkable. His five-year-old son had been fatally wounded by the vehicle that he was driving. I love that man. But his marriage failed. They were never able to have any more children. And for the last 20 years, he's had 15 different jobs in over 20 countries. And you know what, brothers and sisters in Christ? He hates God. He hates him. He hates him the same way that I hated him when I was having my cocaine-induced heart attack. But in an instant, he changed my life. Unfortunately, he hasn't done the same for him. Men and women, we have to we have to put the, the hammer down and put the nails down and stop nailing Jesus Christ to the cross for the things that have happened in our lives. This is what I would like to do, please. We've talked about the four pillars, and we're going to end here in the next minute. We've talked about the four pillars of mercy. God forgiving his children, you and I. His children forgiving each other. 
his children forgiven themselves and his children forgiven God. So I know, unless you've lived some sort of saintly life, that there is a person, place, or event in your life that you've experienced that needs mercy. And what I'd like to do here in closing, I'd like everybody to, to just close your eyes. This isn't grade school, but just bear with me, please. If you could close your eyes and think of that person, it may be a father, it may be an uncle, it may be a high school math teacher, it may be a, a, a coach of your basketball team when you were younger, I want you to focus on that one person that desperately needs your mercy. And that person may be the person you wake up to in the morning and you look in the mirror. It may be an ex-husband. And let's do this. Let's pray the Our Father together. Very slowly, please. And when we get to that line where we have to forgive, forgive others as we expect to be forgiven, let us really focus on that person, please. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen.